long, long day. I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow, and I am Father Matthew Cowth, and we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Ten Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen. Hello, Father Winslow. Well, hello, dear Father. How are you? Ah, uh, fine. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> You know, that's another one of those words that conveys so much meaning depending upon how one says it. Is that not true? Mm, true. When you say to someone that has been scorned, what's the matter? Nothing. I'm fine. That's true. <laughs> but it is a wonderful social lubricant. It is. Because it gets you by without lying. That's true. That's true. Right? It's, it's a very it's, fine word. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've used it many a time. Indeed. <laughs> that's a really good interest. That's an interesting topic right there. Um Right to know something. The right to know something. Yeah, you know, uh, I think we've talked about it in the context of formation. When people inquire about your life, Mm. it seems just a little too personal. And yet, you want to be honest because, you know, you want to be honest. And at what point are you being dishonest if you don't divulge more personal items? Or, Or, for example, can you... So, sort of just only answer to a certain degree, even though it's slightly deceptive. Right. It's almost like I'm talking to a moral theologian. <laughs> <laughs> I like to tell people that I have um, friends who are good moral theologians. I call them for all my loopholes. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a little stickler on some of these things, though. I That's a good one. You know, there was a line that St. Philip Neri used to use a lot we just had his feast day not long ago he got from the song of songs which is segreto mia mihi segreto meo mihi which is just my secret is my own and he would use that principally about those things that were most intimate to him relative to his prayer life or to sort of what was going on in his interior life in any way shape or form Um, but he would do it with a sort of smile as the reports say in such a way that People didn't feel as if they were being shut down, but that there was something that was precious to him that he wasn't going to to let out. Um, Mm. And as priests, I think that one of the things that strikes me relative to our own interior life, for better or for worse, is that the faithful are always getting it. They're always receiving whatever's going on. Yeah. Um, Because what else do I have to give them? Mm -hmm. The Dominican motto is, contemplata aliis tradere, which is to, to hand on to others what you yourself have contemplated. And so, Did you always speak Klingon so well? <laughs> <laughs> or Chuan is that Latin Chuan. with a Klingon accent? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> on a big forehead. Um, the, the idea is that you're handing on what, you, what you've seen, right? What you've yeah. contemplated, what you've studied, etc. And so clearly what one is receiving relative to homilies and things of that nature is is something deeply about, interior about your interior yeah and even that you have to be sort of careful because it it's the faith you're trying to reveal right not and yourself yet it's not without you and, and your, the way in which you're affected by it but relative to just like the regular circumstance of the door yeah right so or like at the door of the church someone says oh father how are you oh i'm fine or one of our seminarians they're visiting for the weekend hey you know how are you what's your name where are you from right um so what was it like in college for you or did you date? And mm. suddenly it takes a turn for towards the personal. Right. And these young men, you know, they're young. They, they want to be honest and sincere. Uh, but at the same time, at some point, do you just not answer or do you deflect? Uh, what is the right amount of depth for yeah. certain conversations? It's a certain art, I would imagine. Well, I think that the example you like to use of the onion is a good one. I mean, there are different layers that people should have access to, and no one has a right to force a layer. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with 
even doing so in a sort of kindly, and that's why I brought up Philip Neary, furtive or, or jocular way to say, if someone said to you, did you date a lot when you were in high school? Oh, Lord, have mercy. It's been, for me, if, I, if someone asked me that, I'd be like, it's been so many years I couldn't possibly remember. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'd have to check a yearbook. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you can deflect it in, in a nice right. way to say right. you, you just crossed a line there that I'm not going to come come across. As yeah. And well, sometimes it goes the other way, right? Where you say, hey, how are you? And they really tell you. Yes. And you, you know, this was just a social way to say, I care about you. <laughs> but I'm not interested in hearing about it right now, right? That we don't really mean that. Uh, people just mean to check in generally, not specifically. Well, it's true. And that's, again, what you, you use that phrase, social lubricant, because you, you're you trying to treat other people with the same the sort of um, relative kindness that you would treat a friend. But the, the language doesn't mean the same thing as when you say it to a friend. Right. So if I say to you when you just arrived at seminary, how are you? I don't expect to receive just fine. Right. You, you um, expect to go right down to a deeper layer. That's it. Talk to me about you. If that's where things are happening. I was at the grocery store the other day. And of course, again, part of the problem of dressing the way we dress, not, it's not a problem, but it's it confuses the language a bit. Mm. Because I said to the cash register girl, how are you doing? She goes, well, I had a really rough day. Oh, I'm yes. Like, okay, here we go. <laughs> Because of course she sees that I'm that's a priest, true. That's and true. so I felt bad for the people behind us because we just we have a session, right? <laughs> we there. had a little session. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's true. It, 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 you know, I feel for people because uh, when you're in social circumstances mm. or when you're at work, you know, that's a totally different social dynamic. Some people don't want their personal stuff really widely known in a work context, and yet at the same time, they feel pretty close to their coworkers. Yep. But those worlds don't really naturally collide or intersect. So it's kind of nice to have them different and uh, a little bit distinct. But when you get into a conversation, people might start asking questions and it feels uncomfortable. That's probably a good indicator right there. Um, when it starts to feel uncomfortable, a certain depth of information, probably better to pause. I always say, when in doubt, choose silence. Mm -hmm. Because you can never take the words back. Right. You can always go back and say something. It doesn't mean I always follow that advice. <laughs> I, I, I run afoul of it all the time. Sure. But um, yes, I think when in doubt, choose silence. Or in this case, when in doubt, don't overshare. Because it's very difficult to pull that back. And you sometimes walk away feeling uh, uncomfortable. Right. You're uh, exposed. You're socially violated, right? Like, like right. this wasn't right. This wasn't the right. right context. This person, I'm, I'm not comfortable having shared that much with this person. I feel as though I was pressured into oversharing, uh, or maybe circumstances drew things out of me, and the person didn't want to hear it, and I actually right. did tell them things. And it's just better to choose silence when in doubt. Agreed. I totally agree with you. And that there are those layers. Right. Yeah, explain your analogy there. So, uh, with men in formation and in general, and uh, and having conversations with people who are looking for some pastoral guidance, um, I always, you know, say that uh, when talking about levels of disclosure, that you have many layers and it, appropriately so. And it doesn't mean that we're duplicitous; that the layers betray one another. But in fact, they're just uh, think of it as a deeper color. The more you go to the core. Um, and it's okay and appropriate to interact with people at one layer or next, depending on where that relationship has fallen or where it's naturally grown to. But people don't have a right to suddenly insert themselves and go deep. Right. Uh, that's not appropriate. And you shouldn't feel compelled yeah. uh, just because some people are inquiring and some people are Pestering. You know, they can be downright pestering about <laughs> wanting to know about you. And it's flattering to a certain degree. Like, that's nice that you have that interest in me. But on the other hand, whoa. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's a voyeur. Yeah. This, <laughs> Stop I mean, looking at my windows at this night. Would like, this would take a full year of spiritual direction before I start talking yeah. about this. You want, you know, after two minutes of meeting you, yeah. turn around right into this. Um, that's a little exaggeration, but still, it feels like that it way does. sometimes. So having, uh, we're like a, yeah, we're an onion, and the onion, it's integral, it's not um, compartmentalized, but it's just layers that go deeper, 
and we have relationships that hit different layers and sometimes and ideally they grow and they grow deeper and for some people you become fast friends they it happens at a quicker pace and you recognize that that happens so quickly that hey there's a unique connection here because that normally doesn't happen that quickly with yeah. someone or if there's somebody that stays on the outside for a while and that's just the way because socially that's the way it works and it actually works nice and it's good to have people just there because it's exhausting to maintain deep friendships yeah. uh, you know you can't have your 100 best friends uh, i don't know who can pull that one off Exactly. Um, it's just just downright exhausting. I, I don't know. How, I couldn't keep up with the texts. No. Um, if that were the case, so you know, it's we're meant to have these different layers, and it's not duplicitous, and we're not being um, false with someone else just because we're at a different layer. It's, it's always a question that comes up in moral theology class relative to the nature of lying, because you began the discussion by talking about people's right to know, and that was sort of a bifurcation of the topic. Wait, wait, wait let's on. before you jump in. Mm. So you and I are familiar with this discussion. That's why I'm going to describe it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Just, just right fact, to know like and lie. How do, what is a lie? What yeah. is a lie? And so there was a time period, and one of the attempts to describe what a lie is is that you don't have to give someone information to which they don't have a right. And so when you're speaking, if the person doesn't have a right to the knowledge, you're dissimulating or saying something that's not uh, not consonant with the truth. It's not a lie. Because you're not trying to deceive, but that's not at all what the tradition used to say. That was yeah. a, an attempt by a particular religious order to make good on the fact that someone doesn't have a right to that. Yeah, and it gets into all sorts of interesting questions about, you know, wartime and camouflage and espionage, right? And a thousand different topics, right? Um, but Thomas Saint Thomas is, is takes his his cue from Saint Augustine, and they're pretty severe on it because of the nature of. Because the nature of what the, what truth is, and because it's necessary for our salvation, necessary for our freedom, not just the truth of salvation history and the truth of Jesus Christ, but but also just speaking the truth with people. If you don't do it, you can't be in a relationship with anyone. And because it's so important, St. Thomas and St. Augustine were quite severe on the fact that you can never ever say something that's contrary to the truth that's in your mind. Hmm. Ever. Well, you can. You can. I mean, you, you, right. in terms of possible, right. you're not permitted to right. relative to sin. Right. And so, they sort of take it out of the realm of whether the person has the right to know. And that's that's getting back to your point earlier about um, you don't have to say anything. Mm -hmm. You can say things that are very clever um, mm -hmm. at, at times if you're quick witted. And I had a one wonderful priest one time when we were discussing this. And we're talking about the classic example of moral theology about, okay, it's, you know, it's wartime, World War II, and, and I have Jews hiding in my basement. And the Nazis come in, are you hiding Jews, right? And so we, at table, we're going back and forth and all the things you could or could not say right. or whatever else. And, and this priest just looked at us and said, you know, you don't have in this scenario the gift of the Holy Spirit relative to counsel. Like, how do you know what you would do in the moment? Because this is going to require a kind of wisdom that you don't necessarily have in the abstract. And I love that answer. Mm -hmm. That in the actual situation, it's a real situation with real divine grace. Mm -hmm. And an appeal to, to the Holy Spirit, you might just come up with some sort of situation that you could never think of in the abstract that fits the equation. Right. And I appreciated that because it's true. It's what our Lord said about, I will give you the words to speak. But silence is always possible too. Well, you know, um, I remember reading a book it's about these two protestant women they were sisters uh, i think they were somewhere like the netherlands or belgium in, in, in that region nazi occupation mm. they were helping uh, jewish families jewish people on the run uh, running for their lives and they were in this situation they were devoutly christian and um and because they were devoutly christian they were not succumbing to the darkness that was befalling mm. their neighbors, particularly their Jewish neighbors, and they wanted to help. And so they were helping. They put themselves in, in harm's way, and they ultimately ended up in a concentration camp. But I remember a scene, and I apologize for those people who may have read the book and they have a better memory of it than me, but I think there's this is the gist of it. They had hidden a, a person behind um, a panel in the wall when 
these officers came to the door and precisely asked the question, are you hiding any Jews? And the sisters were fastidious about not doing anything to offend God. Mm. And in particular, the one sister. And she said, oh, we're hiding them in the walls. It came off so ridiculous that the officer heard it as, you know, her being snarky and ridiculous. But she told the truth. <laughs> and they totally dismissed it. And they checked around the house and then they laughed. <laughs> uh, but it was That's really, great. you say, That's in the great. moment, the grace. It might be there. She was grace. not going to lie um, because of her convictions. At <laughs> the same time, she had the grace in the moment to be able to articulate it in a way that made it sound like a complete jest. Yeah, there's a there's an example that St. Thomas uses when he's asking the question about the Egyptians and the Hebrew women when they were when Pharaoh told them they had to slaughter all the firstborn, right? Or slaughter all the, the, mm-hmm. the Jewish boys. And the Hebrew women and the midwives, uh, they didn't conspire together, but clearly um they didn't kill them. And so what happens when they ask the the uh, the midwives what happened, and they said, "Well, the Hebrew women are just so robust, right? They have these babies, and right, they right. Get there because they didn't want to kill them. That's right." And so Thomas asked the question, which is a really interesting question: Is God blessing them because because they lied? Because um, it says that God blessed mm. them, and Thomas's answer is He blessed them because of their fear of the Lord. He didn't bless them because of the lie, which is a really good distinction to Does make. Does it say that she lied? They lied. I mean, they could say, I mean, that could have been true. The women are, but oh, I guess they say they, they have birth before they get there. Yeah. So yeah, yeah so there's some lied. of that going on. Yeah. Well, you know, circling back to your opening statement then, um, what sort of dissimulation or sort of deflecting Mm. is possible yeah. and what's not. Uh-oh, here we go. And that's a really interesting question. Call a more theologian. I Find mean, the loopholes here. You know, because we do understand... <laughs> no, because we do understand the language that we're all using. That's true. And so long as it is a common language, we know that that word fine doesn't mean that everything right. is fine. We know that it means that this is the end of the discussion. <laughs> it's like a yellow and a red light in Italy. Everybody knows. That means go. <laughs> <laughs> if you come to a hard stop, uh, people are going to get killed. Oh, my heavens, yes. That um, just means step on the gas. Yeah. So, no, you're right. I mean, what do these signs really symbolize? Yeah, what is the common grammar? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what else What else do we normally say in those passing moments? I remember there was a wonderful comedian. Uh, I think his name was Regan. And he was talking about the fact that we respond to everything so automatically. We don't oftentimes think about what we're saying. So you're at the airport and um, you check in your ticket, you hit the little buzzer there and you walk onto the tarmac and the stewardess says, have a nice flight. You say, you too. Mm-hmm. Not right, right, right. <laughs> but you get the gist, but right? You, you wish you, them you, well. You wish it well, right? Yeah. You wish the person well. Um, yeah. So what are the sorts of things do we say that we could analyze to see whether or not in the common vocabulary, it's not being deceptive. I think if you, if somebody said to me, I'm fine, and I could see tears in their eyes. Yeah. I don't think they're lying to me. Right, they're not. Right, Be- I think what they're, they're saying is it's not appropriate, or I don't want to impose. Um, so they're... I can get through this. I can get through this, or I'm, I'm giving you an out. Yeah. Uh, so that you don't get into something too heavy yeah. with me. So I, I think you're right. I think that there are ways in which we could read that and understand that they're not being deceptive. They're trying to be gracious. They're trying to give you a, a gentleman's out uh, or they're, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to read the room and say what's appropriate. But of course, most of us in that situation, if we saw them tears in their eyes, we're trying to pull them aside or mm-hmm. you know, reach out them regardless of the circumstance um, or at least get them to a place where they could uh, be a bit consoled. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. We have one seminarian here that every, when you ask him the question, I think you've worked with him to try to get him to not make an entire self-assessment yeah. every time <laughs> someone says, how are you? Because he wants to yeah. enter, he wants to answer perfectly honestly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he just stops. He's not, he's not afraid of 
awkward pauses or silences. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason we respond so quickly is that we want to fill the gaps with speech. We don't usually allow for a lot of silence in a conversation. And this individual will just stop and think for a while. It may be a long while. Right. And then he might just say, I'm, I'm fine. Like he's, he he's really checked a, He's in. at a system check. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> oh. You know, you're getting an honest response. That That's is, true. you know, it, you got to love the... Uh, it's charming. The, um, the colorful array of personalities that oh. God has allowed us as individuals to possess. Isn't it true? It, it, it's great to appreciate them when you can. Uh, it can be hard sometimes because uh, when you're dealing with somebody who um, doesn't react or relate to things in the same way you do, it's very difficult to read and communication suffers. And for someone who's social, if you don't have good communication, that creates a very anxious place. You know, we might start speaking too much mm. or maybe we need to get a, we need to pull away because I am, I, as a highly social person, I'm not able to communicate and this makes me, this puts me in a place I'm not normally in. Right. A place where I can't socialize pro, the way that in which I'm comfortable or with the means that I have. And so you run away from it. But to be able to maybe overcome some of that anxiety um, and to just allow yourself to experience the difference in that person and that character mm -hmm. You'd be, I think we'd be surprised how much we might truly appreciate or be amused yeah. by the other. Oh, I think so too. I mean, every character is, if it's true that everyone is in the, made in the image of God, it's not exactly the same. I mean, there's, there's an infinite ways in which to reflect the, the Godhead, right? And so every, every person um, is a slightly different manifestation. Certainly the image of God is found in our own capacity to know and to love, but, but to know and to love as you. And that's that's slightly different than mm -hmm. knowing and loving as anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking about two two things of pedagogical concerns that are interesting or, or communication concerns that I was once told by a priest when he said, I have a thing that I do in communication with others where if I want them to speak and I want them to sort of speak more and divulge things, I don't think he meant it in a manipulative way. Mm -hmm. He said, I would look, I look down at my shoes. Hmm. And I always remembered that. And so then, it's a way of indicating that I'm in receiving mode? I guess so. And you're not in any way aggressive by mm -hmm. looking directly at them, mm -hmm. certainly not in a position above them. You know, it always happens to be the case and historically when you design new offices, furniture, things of that nature, that the important person gets the big chair, right? Right, because it's that, that posture makes a difference right. in people's minds, sort of subconsciously. And I noticed, I, I never forgot that. But I, I was watching in the first year we started the seminary. I was watching our incredible uh, Latin teacher, Dr. Nancy Llewellyn, who was really a singular pedagogue. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's just really incredible at teaching. When she's going around the room and she calls them snap drills, she snaps and then points at someone in sort of a misdirected way to give the answer. So you never know. If who's, you're on. who's going to be called. Yeah. Um, and if you don't get it, she doesn't um, sit there and stare at you if you're seated and stand over you. She gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Hmm. A really interesting uh, tool to the point where she's usually on her knees, way beneath you, trying to get you to get the right answer. Like a, like a beggar. And eventually, yeah. And eventually, if you still can't get it, she'll... Shift it over to someone she knows knows the answer. I see. And then you have to repeat it. And when you get it, even she, though you just copied, parroted, she does an OJ, which is, you know, well great. done kind of a thing. That's um, really well done. And yeah. it's, it's it really interesting that it so engages the individual to yeah. want to get things right. Like, like we do when we're little kids. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. It's like a puppy wanting the treat. Yeah. At some point, you want to give it to them. Yeah. No, that's really, that's really well stated. Yeah. And very well done on her part. Well, no, of course, she's, she's incredible. Like there's any surprise in that. She's amazing. All right. So before we go, mm. what uh, what do you have in your mind, if anything? I mean, we just entered after the Feast of Pentecost back into ordinary time. Yeah. Well, I have to say, well, this could be a whole talk at some point, but... I think I know where you're headed. I mean, we have to talk about this at some point. 
I discovered the most fun text in reading the Summa in St. Thomas Aquinas. Secunda Secunda question 168, where Thomas says, it is a, a vicious thing and sinful to be a bore. So maybe it could be a topic for Yes, I, well, maybe the next one. <laughs> I applaud it. What a great it. line. <laughs> a fantastic line for St. Thomas. I think um, we're going to have to reflect upon that one. Tease Fair it enough. out. Tease it out. On a more mundane level, do you have anything? Ah, well, I, usually my, my life is mundane. filled with mundane well, things. Well, I know. You're, 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 the, you're the administrator par excellence. <laughs> you know, I had um, a woman, we had an event this afternoon at the, the Pastoral Center in the diocese where we fed our, our staff, our, you know, 100 people, food and things, to have a little social event. And uh, she said, uh, Father, you need to come down on Thursdays and give out food at the food pantry. And she said it in a way like, you need to come. And as if, as if I'm maybe not giving it its due attention. Mm. And I said, I, I will, I would like to, that would be nice. And then she said it again. And I said, would you like to come up and do what I'm doing? Because I think five <laughs> minutes you'd be running down to the food pantry and <laughs> washing your hands of it. So, <laughs> so please do not assume that I, like I'm up in some ivory castle you know, eating bonbons. <laughs> You know, to be quite honest, give me any day of the week. I'd like to be down there true? and meeting people and, and handing things out. Um, yeah, so, you know, it, just, I guess, you know, my, my, my words, of, my, I guess my words of wisdom and my, uh, before we go, a little segment to say, appreciate the administrators in your life. <laughs> um, you know, I used to say as a kid, you never, I never had to worry about toilet paper being in the bathroom or toothpaste in the cabinet your milk in the fridge. And then as you get older, you realize, uh, wait, that doesn't grow on there. Exactly. You know, um, what happens when you run out, right? That means, oh, I need money. Oh, I got to go and the store and get it. Yeah. And those practical things. And in retrospect, you realize I was taken care of. Somebody did that work. Yep. Uh, somebody was concerned about it. Yep. Somebody did the ordering. Somebody got into the house. Somebody paid for it. Somebody put it out there. And, <laughs> I, you just say, oh, that's just growing up and maturing. But in the world of organizations in which we live, that's not dissimilar to administration. No, it's not. And, and I, I find it to some degree to be the same thing with our men. You know, when they get to, toward the end of their life in seminary, they begin to have a really difficult time. And I think it's because, um, you know, they're men. They've been men for, t for some time now, but they're not fathers. Mm -hmm. If they want to be in charge of something, they yeah. want to have something that they can to be give themselves to, for, be yeah. responsible for. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we get to our age, and it's like, <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm happy to I surrender. want to be a grandfather now. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Give me the lounge chair. All right. Well, so we can talk about both of these topics. No, I think indeed. we both hit big topics on the Before We Go segment. So we'll say goodbye, and then maybe next time we'll touch on them. Have a great week. All right. Ciao, ciao. Bless. Makes me Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time. From the Rooftop. Anywhere.